Yeah, yeah, what's good? Welcome to Cine 230 Remix Cultures. I'm the real Dr. Dre, aka Food Stamp, aka Andre. Here at Goat's Beard Homestead, chilling on the pooper. <laughs> Just, you know, pulled, it, pulled this out of a bathroom remodel, but you know, hey, gonna break it out. Use it as a lectern for today, fuck it, right? Anyways, I uh, hope you're good. Um, hope everything's all right with y'all. But we are in day two of week two. We're gonna talk a little bit about copyright history. Now, hold your excitement. I know like you're still rattled from last class, but you know, we'll try to keep it, we'll try to keep it tight and right because I want you to know how we got to this point, right? How we got to this point in the world um, you know, where copyright lasts for, you know, life plus 70 years or 95 years if you're, you're a company, all the things that it covers, right? But I want you to look, you know, at this slide. Uh, you can follow the copyright two slides. And I'd like to show this image of these kids huddled around a computer. And I usually ask students, you know, what are they doing? And the first thing I say is don't say watching porn because they're probably not doing it, but they could be. Uh, but the, the answer is, right, like what, what could they be doing? They could be writing a paper, they could be watching a YouTube video, they could be making a video mashup and uploading it to their YouTube, they could be making hot trap beats, um, they could be uploading their hot trap beats to SoundCloud, right? They could be torrenting files, they could be streaming Netflix or Spotify, um, they could be using Photoshop or Illustrator, uh, they could be editing film or uploading film, you know, whatever it is. They could be selling spice on the dark web. I don't really know, right? But the thing is this, and what I want you to think about is we have these tools, right? These technologies, computers, the internet, right? That allow us to both create copyrights, create works, and also allow us to infringe on people's work. So in the process of the kids making the hot trap beats, they're downloading, you know, uh, samples from YouTube, and using the chopping those up and making their beats and then putting their art you know back out there their their you know um the meme that they're making in photoshop if that's if they get that fancy right um you know they're grabbing that image from from the web and bringing it in so their way you know the way of creating oft, often requires a little bit of infringement so a couple things about copyright and industrial priority and main industries we're talking about are the content industries uh, TV, radio, film, music industry, video game industry, books, um, you know, art, um, you know, if you think of all of dance, you know, you think of all the things that copyright protects, those are the industries, not all of them, right, but uh, those are the, many of the industries that have a prioritization on copyright. Um, so th th it's important to note that the regulation of Copyrighted works, right, um, you know, shapes the media industries themselves. So laws around copyrights govern many, many things for these industries and for us as consumers, right? So in, uh, in the media itself, in the media industries itself, right, there's, there's sort of three ways in which copyright plays a major role. Number one, it impacts creative decisions, right? Uh, you want to adapt a book into a film, right? Uh, you can only do that if you can license the book. You want to use uh, a song at the end of your film. You have to be able to to license it, right? You want to um, include, you know, something in a video game, you know, um, whatever, a logo or, what, or, or, or graffiti art or whatever, right? And you can only do that if you can get permission, and a permission is a license, okay? Number two, it's the foundation for most corporate structure of these industries. What is a record label? What is a video game publishing company? What are they really at their essence or their core? They're a catalog of copyrights. Like if I were to buy Universal Records, right? One of the largest record companies in the world. You know, you wouldn't buy much of like physical infrastructure or anything. You buy their catalog of copyrights. Think about when Disney bought, um, you know, Star Wars from George Lucas, right? I don't know if they got the ranch, but like they bought the right to use the name Luke Skywalker. They bought the right to make a new damn Star Wars movie every friggin' six months. I mean, every six months? It's like three years in between movies in the original, original run. We're getting a new Star Wars, like, fuck, now it's gonna be on 
streaming. We're going to get like a friggin' Jawa movie next. You know what? Oh, let's hear the backstory of the sand people. Fuck, man. Anyways. Um, but that's what corporations are. Like they're intellectual property catalog. So uh, think about something, a company like Nike. Nike doesn't have a lot of actual resources, like physical resources. They don't own most of, most of their stores are franchise stores. They don't own um, manufacturing facilities. They have their campus and stuff. But what is the majority of the value of a company like Nike? It's patent catalogs and the value of the swoosh. Just to be able to put the swoosh on sneakers is worth like half of its value because that's what they that's what they own just like a record label owns the right to make copies of um and distribute copies of an album or you know video game publisher with video games or or whatever okay lastly it guides consumption copyright guides consumption what can we and can't we do with um, these media products that we consume and for the most part we can't do much other than consume them at least legally you know unless fair use is involved hey sunshine coming out wonder how that's affecting my lighting right now um the important part though is these media companies are the greatest policers and enforcers of these rules and they also through lobbying help to shape these lo- these rules to favor their personhood corporate personhood Okay, and they are like the sort of, you know, Disney at all, sort of like the mainstream version of remix culture. And they determine what type of remixing is legal and what isn't. So what you remix and how you tweak things and change things and put them back out there to the world, right, may not be legal, right? Because you're not out there lobbying Congress. You're not shaping these laws to reflect your interests, right? Um, it's you have other people shaping these laws, um, and then, you know, you have to sort of um, negotiate those and how you're going to deal with them. So the way that I think of piracy, I don't like the word piracy. The word piracy was created, um, I think, in the 60s or 70s to sort of criminalize unauthorized uses. So piracy is unauthorized uses, okay? The important thing to note, though, is almost every media industry in the United States, these industries that currently uh, lobby to extend copyright that, um, you know, enforce and sue consumers, sue one another, um, you know, enforce these rules, uh, you know, uh, they were all born out of unauthorized uses. So the book industry in the United States did not rep- recognize uh, the authorship of authors from other countries. Um, and so it allowed for in the United States in our early days for, you know, uh, this 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 bootleg boot in, uh, book industry to start where, you know, um, instead of getting, a, you know, seven or twenty dollar leather bound charles dickens book you could get a 10 cent one and then you ben franklin you know he owned like the like one of the largest corporations in terms of you know string of printers in the united states and benefited heavily from this piracy but the united states because we didn't recognize foreign authors in the united states man like we just pirated their works now that's kind of bad, right? Like, not cool. But it's one of the reasons why America was or is a fairly literate country is because of democracy. Democracy meaning access to books. If reading was the activity of those who could afford a $10 leather-bound edition, um, it would be only something that wealthy people could do. But since us peasants could buy a book for 10 cents, we learned how to read. And, you know, you look at the history of reading and writing and how it's related to the church and, you know, um, only like priests, you know, could write and read um, the Bible. And then, you know, their, their word was the word of God and all that stuff, and, you know, created, you know, important power dynamics, um, you know, historically, how controlling, you know, the content um, was about controlling people and, and, and viewpoints. But the point is, 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 is you know, when we didn't have a lot of American authors to create new content, we could pirate the content of European authors. Now, what this did for Charles Dickens as a primary example, right? This is someone whose works were heavily pirated. He lost a lot of money in the United States. It forced him to guess what? Innovate. Because he had no copyright here. He had to come here and he would read his books and you could pay for his performance 
of his books. And this was like really important. It forced him, instead of just sitting on his catalog and being able to sue people or, or profit off of his catalog, it forced him to do something new, it forced him to innovate, right? And this is a very important thing when you have limited copyright, is that it does actually force you to do something new versus just sitting on something you made one time that's really popular and profiting off of it. So the book industry born out of piracy. Yo, the film industry was crazy. We're gonna watch a video, yo. Thomas Edison made shit movies. He made horrible movies, had no creative views. He also wasn't a great inventor. He had a great team of inventors, but he also was really good at patenting and suing the shit out of other people. That was kind of like the basis of his legacy, but we remember him as a great American inventor regardless. Him, Lubin, all these early, um, you know, all these early film companies, right? Almost all of their works were pirated. They took books, plays, magazine stories, made them into movies. They were so bold to take European movies, right? Movies made in Europe and put their own names on them and show them in the United States. And, 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 and you know, this was like the history of piracy. We're going to watch a drunk history here in a few moments. That also shows how, you know, uh, early filmmakers who did not want to pay into the Edison Trust, who did not want to pay to license his, um, you know, uh, kinetoscope, kinetographs, etc., and um, part of his cartel um, didn't want to play play that rule. They moved from New Jersey to Hollywood, and that's how Hollywood started. And it was started through piracy, right? Unauthorized uses of intellectual properties. Um, the record industry, the music industry, totally born out of piracy. Whose works did they pirate? You remember the guy with the beard and no mouth and all the, all the medals, right? Um, you know, John Philip Sousa, right? Composers. The early music industry didn't have compositions or songs, so they took sheet music and they replayed it and they sold it as discs or as cylinders, right? Now, eventually, John Philip Sousa and everybody, you know, got mad and they worked out a, a, a performance licensing agreement where when, um, you know, there was the performance of compositions um, in a sound recording, right, um, the composers and songwriters would get, would get paid, but they pirated the works, right, because it made for cheap content. They didn't have to create new content and that's what helped the industry get off the ground is they didn't have expensive content. Well, when radio came out in the 1920s, most of it was, um, you know, uh, scripted entertainment, news, etc. That's a lot of content to create and put, you know, put on the airwaves uh, 24 hours a day. So when the ra early radio days, when they were looking for cheap content, where did they go? Boom. The music industry. Let's play other people's music. We could fill up hours and hours of time playing other people's music. Well, eventually... You know, people uh, in the record label industry, or the record recording industry, excuse me, you know, they were like, yo, why aren't we getting paid? And radio was like, hey, chill. Like, how about this? We're afraid of John Philip Sousa. So we'll pay when we play your records on the air. We'll pay John Philip Sousa and composers for the performance of their um, compositions in the sound recording. However, um, we're promoting your records. We're promoting your records. So maybe we don't have to pay you. And the recording industry like bought into this. And so still to this day, when records or songs are played on the radio, record labels and recording artists do not get paid for the performance of their sound recordings on the radio. However, singer, uh, songwriters and composers get paid for the performance of their compositions in those sound recordings, okay? And that's for like analog or terrestrial radio. Um, the record industry, you know, didn't want to get, you know, screwed like that again. So when uh, digital and satellite radio came out, they, <clears throat> they signed up for a pro provision where um, they'll get paid for the performance of sound recordings on digital transmission, satellite radio, Spotify, uh, Pandora, etc. But radio, born out of piracy. All right, I'm sure like, I don't know, out of 100 of you, maybe 15 of you are or Oregonians, but I'll tell you a little story. Um, there was this dude, Ed Parsons. Ed Parsons lived on the coast of Oregon. Um, 
oh shit, I can't remember um, the town right now, but whatever, a coastal town in Oregon. And uh, if you're familiar with the coast of Oregon, it's like a big mountain down to the, down to the ocean. And uh, back in the day, you know, you know, Ed was like trying to get news from Portland or trying to get, you know, Mariners games or broadcasts like TV broadcasts. And you couldn't get anything because the mountains were physical, you know, basically barriers to the TV signals. And so uh, Ed came up with this idea. He's like, yo, I'm going to put up a dish on the hillside and I'm going to run a wire to my crib. And eventually, everybody in this little town, coastal town, found out that Ed was watching Mariners games in the news and shit like that. And they're like, yo, Ed, like, can you hook it up? And Ed was like, all right, cool, 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 chill, chill, chill. How about this? I'll run a wire to your crib too, okay? You can pay me for that. And then you can pay me a monthly service charge and you can watch all this stuff too. And people were like, yo, that's great, Ed, thank you. Like, we just want to watch stuff. Now, does this sound familiar? It's called cable, right? And this was the early start of cable. And early cable TV, you know, Ed and other people around the country, you know, they figured out ways to get TV signals to rural areas. And eventually the TV industry got in, it got regulated and became, became the cable industry. But it started with, you know, uh, unauthorized uses and dissemination and distribution of content. Yo. Things like you enjoy, like Netflix, right? Which I'm sure y'all are enjoying like a mall right now, right? Um, born out of piracy. What? Crazy. Because Netflix are an extension of the home movie market, the rental market, um, the home video sales market, which actually came out of pi piracy. Um, early on, when technologies like the Betamax and VHS came out, um, corporations like the Walt Disney Company and Universal um, you know, sued Sony who put out the early Betamax and it went to, it went to court because it allowed consumers to record TV shows and movies off of TV and watch them when they wanted, fast forward through ads, okay? Now, this was initially considered piracy. Disney lost in the Supreme Court and it ruled that this is cool, which is why we have things like Netflix and DVRs. Check this out. Sun's coming out, feeling pretty nice. Um, so it's pretty important, right? Like, you know, but also born out of piracy. After that, Walt Disney was like, okay, so we lost. How can we monetize our movies and the home, you know, well, let's create the home video market. Let's, well, let's partake in that um, in rental market and let's sell, you can buy our movies and watch them at home. The adult film industry had already been doing this for a while. But porn out of piracy, porn out of piracy. <laughs> Good Lord. Um, and then obviously the ultimate pirate, Apple, right? What interest did Apple have in the recorded music industry? Zero, none, right? So Apple puts out a device called the iPod, right? Now it's now iPads and iPhones and all that stuff. But, you know, Apple put out a way for people to take digital music. The MP3 had existed. They came up with a software that allowed you to rip CDs and then you could put that onto your your device and carry it around. This totally was piracy. It totally, uh, or was perceived as piracy. It totally undermined the, the music industry, the music market, which had relied on selling CDs. And it created a whole new industry. And largely, you know, things that, that you enjoy are the byproduct of this, of this piracy. So I want you to watch this clip. This is called The Sneeze. Okay, now your mind's gonna freaking explode. This shit is brilliant. It's just amazing. No, it's not. Okay, but it's important. This is a Thomas Edison film. Now you can see Thomas Edison creativity on blast here. But the reason why I show you this is because um, the sneeze is um, basically the first uh, film that was registered as a copyright. Now how Edison did this is uh, this came out in 1894. There was no copyright on, on films. Like, you couldn't register a copyright on film. Um, the, it was, the industry was too, too infant at the time. And, uh, you know, the laws are always slow to catch up to technology. But um, he registered each frame as a photograph for copyright. So 
if you think of film, film has 24 frames per second. This film is like 10 seconds long. Um, so uh, we'll pop it on. Um, so yeah, whatever, it was like 240 photographs was the copyright on the sneeze. Now get, get it, your freaking mind is gonna explode when you see this, but I want you to know this was the first um, film to be registered as a copyright and know the methodology of, of how he did it. Now, get ready, this is gonna be brilliant. Right? I told you it was going to be amazing. <laughs> Anyways, um, we're going to watch a drunk history. It talks about the Edison Trust or the Motion Pictures Patent Company. Back in the day, like basically, um, there was a, a bunch of different you know, companies that owned patents on various technologies used um, in shooting and projecting film. You know, one company would own the patent on the sprockets. You know, one would own, you know, the parts of the projection and everybody was suing one another and so what Edison did is he kind of forced everybody that had the various patents to pool their patents into what's called the Edison Trust. Now basically what happened is this allowed them to basically monopolize the film industry. If you wanted to shoot film or show film you had to, you couldn't just buy the technologies, you had to buy and then pay a licensing fee to make film or to show film. So they were fully, fully vertically integrated, meaning Edison, Edison owned or the trust like controlled everything from the film that you bought to how films were made to how they were uh, distributed to how they were exhibited. And um, this, you know, basically created a cartel which was eventually busted by the Supreme Court um, in 1915. Okay, But you're not allowed to be fully vertically integrated in any industry, at least media industry. You cannot own you know, the means of production all the way to how things are, are consumed um, necessarily. So um, anyways, we're going to watch this drunk history. I hope you enjoy it. It'll be a nice break from me who's not drunk and talking about history. Um, but anyways, watch this video. Have some laughs. Uh, we'll connect on the flip side of this and, and rip through class.